Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the first international virtual seminar on wood, pulp, and biorefinery of the Pulp and Paper Laboratory of the Federal University of Wisconsin. My name is Claudio Mudado Silva. I am a professor of the Department of Forest Engineering at the University of Wisconsin. And I work at the Pulp and Paper Lab in, in the area of environmental control. I am very happy to be uh, the host of this session. Uh, first, I would like to thank um, the organizing committee of this event, Felipe Pedersoli, Marcela Cora, Caio Michelino, Professors Yara de Muner and uh, Ana Marcia Ladeira, and um, the whole team that made this first edition of this event possible. We hope all of you and your relatives and friends are fine and in good health. We have a, an immense pleasure to introduce the speaker of this evening seminar, Professor Orlando Rojas. We thank um, Professor Rojas indeed for participating in our seminar, bringing a little of his vast knowledge on forest byproducts. Professor Orlando Rojas is a worldwide renowned researcher in the field of cellulose nanomaterials, nanocrystals, and bio-based materials, among others. He holds a Canada Excellence Research Chair, and he is currently the director of the Byproducts Institute of the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Uh, Professor Rojas is recipient of the renowned Anselm Payne Award, one of the highest recognitions in the area of cellulose and renewable materials. He was elected in 2013 Fellow of the American Chemical Society. In 2017, he was appointed Fellow of the Finnish Academy of Science and Letters. And in 2015, he received the TAPI Nanotechnology Award, among many other awards that he has been receiving uh, in these last years. Uh, we thank very much uh, again, Professor uh, Orlando Rojas for sharing in, in this seminar um, his, his vast knowledge of, of, the, uh, of the, the field that uh, cellulose. And I'm sure that uh, we will have a very nice selected audience that are very keen to hear what uh, Professor Rojas has to present to us tonight. So uh, I pass the floor to Professor Orlando Rojas and thank you very much again. Uh, and have a nice, um, and, and as we were talking before, I hope that uh, the, the internet won't disappoint us, right? And so the floor is yours, Professor. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Claudio. It's a big honor and pleasure to be here with you and with the students and all the audience for this international uh, seminar. Uh, it's very nice because I understood to large extent the seminar is led or organized by the students. Uh, this is very meaningful, so I'm very happy for that. And I'm also very happy to share the time with my colleagues in Brazil and elsewhere 
but especially in Brazil and University of Isosa, I have many friends uh, from uh, University of Isosa and also in Brazil. So just to give a little bit of uh, my background, when, when I was a student of uh, chemical engineering in my home country in Venezuela, I used to read a lot of uh, journal articles from coming from Brazil and some of my textbooks related to pulp and paper engineering uh, were produced in Brazil. So to some extent, I owe Brazil um, a lot of knowledge and the education by way of books and uh, papers that I read coming from Brazil. So I really admire the research that you have in Brazil. Now, that was a long, long time ago. Since I finished uh, my studies in Venezuela, I have been around the world I have been in North Carolina State University and lately uh, between Finland and uh, uh, Canada. And today I'm joining you from Canada. It is uh, almost uh, past 2 p.m. And uh, just wanted to tell that I uh, will be speaking on behalf of uh, these two universities, University of British Columbia and Alto University. And my talk has to do with advances in forest bio products and their utilization, their application. And on the left, you see an image that I'm quite excited. Uh, it's a very recent photo, and I will talk a little bit more about this. Uh, relates to an ongoing exhibition called uh, Helsinki Design Week and has to do with art and design. And I hope that now you can start to wonder what is the relationship between art and uh, forest bio products. So uh, I hope that we make the connection. Anyway, I'm very close to this uh, photo here. This is the campus of uh, University of British Columbia. It's uh, absolutely beautiful, very close to the sea and a lot of green areas. So I think this is very common to all the audience today our love for trees, for wood. <clears throat> and as a new director of the Bioproducts Institute, I, I would like to first introduce the uh, group that is composed of uh, 40 plus professors coming from different disciplines. And this is very nice because uh, I think in our area, there are many new developments and they have happen because the cross-disciplinary work that uh, we see going continuously, not only in Canada, Finland, but in many other places. So more and more, we have more research coming from material science, from physics, but also from art and design, I would like to say, and also from social sciences. So this is a very good time. <clears throat> and COVID is a good opportunity for us to tackle many of uh, uh, future challenges by using different approaches and different disciplines. And another thing that I want to acknowledge is uh, our um, materials bioeconomy cluster in Finland. I'm currently academic PI on behalf of Alto of this uh, cluster of research. So I think uh, this is very nice to see initiatives like in Canada, like in Finland, in Sweden, and in many other places where the area of uh, circular economy and also the bioeconomy are coming along very strongly. So it's a very good period in our research lives, the possibility of using plant resources to solve many of the, of the challenges. <coughs> Here in Canada, I can uh, tell a little bit more about the Bioprose Institute that is in the center. This is the physical location, but it's important to point out the very important collaboration that exists in areas that go from clean energy to synthetic biology and good science, just to name some few. And this makes this type of environment and ecosystem a very powerful one to advance research and knowledge. So I think this is uh, very important to highlight uh, for all the um, uh, attendees to this seminar. Let me just talk at the very beginning a little bit about what I want to share with you today. Um, I, I, I have been trained by looking into fibers, wood fibers, and also wet end chemistry, colloid chemistry. And from that, 
historically, it was very easy for many of us working in this area to go into nanotechnologies. So I want to say that even though I continue admiring and falling in love with fibers, um, with pulp paper, but paper making and printing technologies, nowadays, of course, we're very excited with the introduction of nanotechnologies and also the case of uh, nanomaterials, renewable nanomaterials. And my talk to a very large extent will have to do with renewable nanomaterials. But the question is, what can we do with renewable nanomaterials? And for that, I will refer to bioproducts and I will give some examples in this area. So this is a illustration that we have in a paper that is now on the review. It's a, it's a review paper uh, and, and, and it shows uh, the deconstruction from wood to nanomaterials. And I, 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 I guess that many of the um, uh, present uh, or the attendees to this seminar are familiar with this area. But basically we start with fibers and by different techniques of deconstruction, we reach the nanoscale structures that goes from the microfibrils to the elementary, elementary fibrils, and if we go further to the cellulose chains. So somewhere in the middle between the macroscopic fibers and the molecular cellulose chains, we have the nanocelluloses, as you can see. And of course, those nanomaterials can be produced from uh, wood, but in the case of Brazil, uh, also from uh, other uh, resources like uh, bagas. And depending on the country, there are many other different sources for this type of uh, uh, plant-based materials. Of course, we have also animal and microorganism-based cellulose. So uh, the bacterial cellulose is something that attracts me a lot. And we have a lot of research in this area, but I'm not going to talk about uh, bacterial cellulose today. And um, we'll refer more to wood-based um, nanocellulose. And to highlight the importance of uh, this type of plant-based materials, not only cellulose, but also the other important component in wood like lignin, I bring this um, um, slide here on the right about the case of Finland and the strategy for the future bioeconomy. And if we see it in 2020, we can see the relative value of production of the current forest products. But the estimation in the future years is that that will continue to be an important sector of the industry. But more and more, we're going to see new value added products. Um, these are the ones growing rapidly in blue. And in a country like Finland, uh, the same applies to Sweden. And I suspect also to Brazil, Chile, and many other countries, uh, including Canada. Uh, I think uh, this will make a large impact um, that can be measured in GDP points uh, and also the uh, increase in total exports. So this is very important because I think this is still a prediction and, and who knows af after COVID how the prediction will change. But I'm, I'm suspecting that actually this uh, type of uh, pandemic will make us more aware of the need for sustainable operations and products, and also for the future bioeconomy and also uh, climate change and environment. And in this sense, the new value of products will be increasingly becoming important. And of course, that means a lot of different materials that can be produced from cellulose, lignin, and nanomaterials derived from those two components of plants. So very briefly, I go here very fast taking cellulose fibers on the left and doing microfluidization or many other techniques, we can produce a hydrogel. And in this hydrogel, we have the nanocellulose that is in microns in length and in the nanoscale in the uh, lateral dimension. And you can see here uh, at the nanoscale how this uh, material looks like. And I'm sure many of you are already very familiar with this material. Uh, the other um, important cellulose component that is very typical in our research is the case of cellulose nanocrystals. And uh, in Canada especially, cellulose nanocrystals have become extremely uh, uh, of high interest. And there are several units around that are starting to have demo scale production of this nanomaterial. And the main difference, as you can appreciate, is that we have shorter length rod-like uh, materials 
uh, not as fibrillar as the one that I introduced earlier. The other component is that this element is a chiral, uh, the nanoscale is a chiral particle, and it's also amphiphilic and has some uh, chemical and, and isotropy. And I can talk a lot about each of these uh, topics, uh, but that won't be my, my concentration today, but it's really a fascinating area where we have spent uh, a lot of time. The chirality, for instance, will be something that we can relate later on, including the art and design that I promised that I will talk. And the chirality in these nanomaterials mean that there is a twist that is present in the natural material. So that's quite interesting, and we can make use of those properties. So we have nanocellulose, as I said, which is very relevant, uh, nanofibular cellulose and nanocrystals. Uh, but also, I want to bring to your attention also the possibilities for other nanomaterials, such as lignin micro and nanoparticles. So you see those on top. These are the ones that we have been producing by different techniques. And then also from the plant cell walls uh, and also from bark, uh, we can appreciate the um, utilization of uh, tannic acid and tannin derived particles that we also have been researching. Quite interesting for many, many different applications. So I will briefly talk about those last two components as well. Anyhow, as far as the what we see for the future of um, fibrillated cellulose technologies. Of course, on the left, we have the current application of macroscopic fibers, but consider that even in tissue production, the use of nanocellulose can be considered. And we have a recent work with uh, North Carolina State University where we highlight the potential of nanocellulose addition to paper materials to reduce the weight while uh, keeping the um, uh, performance. Also in buildings that has become very popular, but as we move to the right, then you can see more advanced applications and also um, value added uh, where the revenue can be quite high. Now, are there other types of cellulose nanofibrils? I think this is important because uh, not all the properties of cellulose nanofibrils fit in the specifications and demands of industry. For instance, the hydrophilicity has been always an issue for cellulose-based materials. And for that reason, I bring up the case of acetylated nanocelluloses. This is very important because if you think about the recent developments that uh, we see, for instance, in Japan and the nanocellulose vehicle concept, as an example, cars that are being produced with components made from nanocellulose. Many of those nanomaterials are really esterified nanocelluloses, for instance, by acetylation or other um, uh, approaches. And this is important because what it means is that we can take the fibers, do acetylation, heterogeneous acetylation on the fibers, and then reduce the energy that is consuming the fibrillation to produce this type of nanocellulose at lower energy. That's very important. So we end up producing acetylated nanocelluloses. And, and there is a lot that we have uh, written about it. And, and maybe you can check in the literature more, more details. So the acetylated nanocellulose is, is interesting from uh, uh, some prospects. And I will talk uh, with uh, some examples. And one of those is that they tend to gel at even lower concentrations than uh, the typical uh, regular nanocellulose. And that's in part because of the strong hydrophobic interactions in these nanomaterials. And that means that acetylated nanocellulose can be used at very low concentrations for uh, applications like emulsion stabilization, but also 3D printing. Very interesting that with very small modifications, we can fine tune um, the properties of the nanomaterial. And this is how the nanocellulose look, a little bit different than the typical one. Anyway, if we think about nanocellulose, we have in the center nanofibrillated cellulose, as I talked before. The other one that is very well known is the tempo oxidized nanocellulose that form these beautiful gels, and then the acetylated um, nanocellulose, uh, in this case, produced by heterogeneous acetylation. And you can see for relatively similar rheological properties, uh, we need much less concentration of the acetylated nanocellulose because the property that I mentioned earlier. 
Let me turn now your attention to lignin. And, uh, and here I think we have proposed a very unique way to produce uh, lignin nanomaterials. So the production of uh, lignin particles uh, uh, using solvent shifting or anti-solvent methods has been known since um, uh, quite a, uh, several years ago. But uh, in those methods, usually you obtain lignin particles that are going to be dispersed in a liquid medium. Uh, what is different here is that we have a system where we use an aerosol flow reactor to uh, uh, atomize black liquors or lignin solutions that are carried by a gas carrier. And by using a sonication or a vibrating membrane, we produce liquid droplets that are carried up in the heated tube that you see on top. And then by surface tension, the lignin solution becomes uh, uh, spherical droplets, and then eventually they become spherical particles. So this is what is illustrated here. And several reports from our group uh, have uh, shown uh, the properties of these uh, nanomaterials that are quite interesting for a number of applications. So I'm very keen about seeing the use of uh, lignin micro and nanoparticles in the future. And one beautiful aspect of uh, these particles that I always mention in my talks is that uh, here we have a beautiful knob where we can control the surface energy, wettability, and in general, the chemistry and properties in general, including thermal properties of these lignin particles. And this is depending on the processing that we use to obtain the lignin from, we can change, for instance, the surface energy from being very high on the far left to being very low on the far right. So more wettable to less wettable. And of course, on top of this, we can think about the source. It would be very different if we use a, a pinos or an eucalyptus or a, a bagas derived lignin uh, to produce this uh, nanoparticle. So uh, I think for some people, this variability is a problem, but I see the other way around. The, this possibility to produce different materials from plant-based resources is quite interesting. <clears throat> What can we do with these lignin particles? This is an example of the things that we have been playing around. And one of those is to produce coatings with lignin particles. On the left, you can see a cross section of a coating on a solid support of the lignin particles. And I'm not going to talk about details because of time, but yeah, these are polydispersed particles that self-assemble and distribute in such a way that the packing of the particles can be controlled. And that also means that the transport properties of the coatings uh, can also be fine-tuned. And having a surface that is rough because of the particles means that with a very mild surface modification, then the surface of the coating can become superhydrophobic. And this is what we see on the right for a superhydrophobic coating uh, ap applied on glass using lignin particles. So the prospects in the area of coatings um, and uh, surface modifications are, of course, very high. The other example that is very recent uh, that was published this year uh, in ACS uh, Applied Material Interfaces is that with the same lignin particles, we can produce uh, films, uh, we can call them membranes. And in these membranes, uh, we combine the cellulose uh, nanofibrils actually as a binder for the lignin particles, and we obtain uh, self-standing films or membranes as the ones that you see uh, round on top in brown color. And these membranes can be used as a filter. And in this case, we put this in a syringe and we use them as a way for us to produce anti-oxidative microfiltration. And it was quite nice. And on the right, we demonstrate the antioxidant uh, capacity of uh, lignin that is well known how a membrane free of lignin is not able to change the color of an ABTS uh, solution uh, on the uh, right from one on the left where the membrane contains lignin particles and very rapidly is able to um, uh, produce a reducing effect and an antioxidative microfiltration. So if on top of this, we 
think about uh, the antibacterial properties of lignin, I think there are many opportunities in the biological space for application of these particles in many areas, including crop protection and coatings. So um, this is just to see the idea that uh, with these combinations of uh, lignin and also nanocellulose, one can obtain very interesting membranes, uh, as I said before, for antioxidant uh, uh, applications, but also for UV protection as uh, is illustrated on the right, and also for 3D printing. Um, the other nanomaterial that I wanted to briefly talk is the case of tannins. And here we have a map of the different types of uh, hydro hydrolysable uh, tannins. And as you can see in the bottom, they have some very interesting uh, um, properties that are very relevant nowadays from uh, anti-mutagenic, antimicrobial, anti-inflammatory. So these are very interesting particles. And I have been always wondering if we can make such particles of tannic acid in such a way that we can control the shape. Because um, my uh, hypothesis here to you is that the shape is very important in the applications. We think about cellulose and fibrils being fibrillar in shape. And in this case, we talk about uh, lignin spheres and here now with a, on a variety of shapes uh, for tannic acid particles. So we have been looking into ways to produce uh, by self-assembly tannic uh, particles with a variety of shapes. And this is beautiful because those shapes can be used for uh, targeting different applications. And I believe that different shapes will give different control on the performance of the material. Of course, here you wonder how can we control the shape? And that has been always uh, uh, something that I think uh, is important for us to consider. And for that, uh, I just want to briefly put an example how current technologies can be quite uh, useful. And in this case, in collaboration with our colleagues in uh, Finland that work on artificial intelligence and machine learning, we have found a very interesting possibility to combine optimization procedures so that in a very uh, short uh, uh, time and uh, with a very low economy in as far as the experiments that are needed, we can optimize with a minimum number of, number of experiments the uh, map of the um, morphogenesis of the particle. So we can predict the particle shape depending on the properties of the solutions that we use. And this is uh, quite relevant. Uh, as a way to really screen data and uh, optimize the production of particles with different properties. So just to put the idea that uh, machine learning has become a very important tool in uh, many of our applications. So now I will go more to how we can use these materials. And, and I have three types of applications. I have used this in the past in other talks. But today, I also wanted to introduce some new materials. So I have added some uh, slides containing new developments that I want to share. But to make this uh, more or less uh, order, uh, I put here the talk in starting with one dimension and going through two dimi dimensions and uh, materials in three dimensions. So um, of course, when we think about one dimensional uh, structures, we can think on filaments, for example. In the case of two, 2D um, uh, materials, we're talking about films and coatings. And for three structure, three dimensional structures, then you can think about on advanced materials, foams, uh, hydrogels, on aerogels, and many others. So let's talk a little bit about some of these. In the one dimensional aspect, uh, that is um, uh, one dimensional films, I think uh, these are very interesting nowadays because. In our area of forest products, uh, I see around us that there are a lot of investments and big interest by industry in the area of uh, next generation textiles. And therefore, thinking about one dimensional elements can be quite relevant uh, nowadays. And in the case of um, Alto in Finland, uh, there are many excellent examples about how to convert wood into textile materials. Of course, this is very well known since um, decades ago. But what is different nowadays is the way that we use green chemistries, especially uh, recyclable ionic liquids to dissolve not only pure cellulose, but actually the whole wood, including lignin, 
or for that matter, recycled uh, paper or recycled textiles containing or not lignin to produce a dope that not only contains, again, uh, cellulose, but also may contain hemicellulose, lignin, or even dyes in the case of recyclable textiles. And from those to produce next generation filaments for textiles. And this has been very important. And in the case of Alto University, uh, I think uh, it's important here to say the need for us to brand uh, these technologies and to market them in the proper way. And two examples here, you can appreciate on the left and also on the right, and the right is particularly the case of the first lady in Finland wearing a dress that was produced from wood by using the so-called ion cell process. And that's from my colleagues in, in Finland. So it's very interesting uh, development. For our own research in our group, we do uh, similar efforts, but uh, we don't use ionic liquids. We, we do, but in this context, I want to introduce uh, more like the use of nanocellulose that I introduced earlier, and I will give some examples. So the case of um, nano fibrillated cellulose uh, free of lignin, and also nano fibrillated cellulose containing lignin, and that you see on the top right, uh, as an example, and, and, and I like the case of lignin containing nanocellulose, since I think there are huge opportunities in this area, even though there are not many papers, uh, in a, relatively speaking, not many papers exist in the case of lignin containing nanocellulose. Anyhow, in the video that you see in the bottom, you see how the nanocellulose can be um, dispersed in aqueous uh, medium, and then using a coagulation bath that is maybe an acidic solution, also water with acid or ethanol, then you can have coagulation and produce a filament. So this is a truly green process that can be scaled up and can be used for producing a different type of filament compared to the ones on the left. Nevertheless, an important one because it can produce properties that are quite different um, compared to those that are produced from cellulose dissolutions. Um, so uh, here I show more or less as, uh, the same information and I provide here in the bottom some references for you to check if you are interested. But my point here that I wanted to make is the fact that the anti-solvents that we use in the coagulation bath are simply water with HCl, with calcium chloride, or organic solvents, ethanol or acetone, and they really act very good as a, um, a coagulants or anti-solvents for the nanocellulose dope to become a filament that can be spin out. And this is an example of the unit that our students in mechanical engineering uh, have designed for this purpose. And maybe there is a video here that illustrates this better in action. Of course, it's a small unit, a slow um, production rates, but puts the idea that this is extremely simple to do and quite promising. And, and uh, our colleagues uh, uh, in other places are very active in this area. I should mention, for instance, the efforts, the beautiful work in, in, in Sweden in KTH and RISE and uh, collaborators that uh, have, have developed this area quite nicely, especially using cellulose nanocrystals. So here we deal with nanofibular cellulose, nevertheless, and we look into different property spaces. And I think this is very promising area. If we use acetylated nanocellulose that I introduced earlier, then you can think about the same process, but with a new uh, a spectrum of uh, properties. And this is the beauty of having these modifications on nanocellulose because then we can open new uh, developments as far as the application. Uh, so this is a very busy slide and you can see in the bottom the, mm, the papers in the area, but um, the, in a nutshell, what we want to say here is that these um, um, acetylated nanocellulose produce extremely tough uh, materials, meaning that they are strong, but also very extensible. You can see here the strain uh, reaching out to 30%, 30, uh, yeah, in the range of 30%. And these are the samples in blue. And, and they are quite competitive if you think about uh, how they compare with other uh, commercial uh, materials. So as far as extensibility is quite interesting. But also, as far as the water resistant, these um, materials, these filaments that are produced by acetylated nanocellulose are, are uh, water resistant. 
Now, if we put back lignin that I mentioned before, we have been adding lignin by mixing lignin with tempo oxidized nanocellulose. That would be the option two on the right. But we could also have the residual lignin in the nanocellulose and use the natural lignin that exists in the nanomaterial. And in both cases, we can produce uh, filaments. Uh, if we think on the right, what I want to say here is that filament spinning with pure lignin is extremely difficult. Uh, in the past, we have worked on uh, lignin nanofibers using electrospinning um, and uh, other techniques. But uh, when it comes to wet spinning, as I showed, this is very difficult. So we really here, we need to add the component on the right, that is nanocellulose. And that combination, the same that I presented for membranes, is actually a quite interesting one. Because combining the two, then we can produce a material that is strong enough to be drawn in the spinning bath and to produce a filament. And what is beautiful about these filaments is that uh, those filaments uh, have some degree of order and alignment. Therefore, they are relatively strong. Of course, when you are lignin, the strength will be reduced to some extent. But nevertheless, there is a compromise between the addition of uh, lignin and, and the nanocellulose. So we have added up to 70% lignin in these filaments, and still you can produce uh, good filaments, like the ones on the far right. And that vertical column, these are 70% lignin, 30% uh, nanocellulose. And then those can be carbonized. And why to do this? Of course, the idea here is that lignin has a very high carbon yield. And that means that we can produce carbon fibers quite easily. And these carbon fibers show very interesting properties, not only very good yield, but also the properties after carbonization of these uh, microfibers is such that they are mesoporous, and that means that they can be ideally suited to produce uh, electroactivity. So the case of uh, that I want to refer here is these uh, porous uh, um, filaments that are highly conductive, as, as uh, this uh, process shows, and is also capacitive. It's, it works qu quite nice as a supercapacitor. But the main point here that I want to highlight compared to other carbon materials is the low temperature of carbonization. So it's in a single step carbonization with no pre-steps uh, is possible to produce a carbon fiber. So I think this is very important when we talk about carbon fibers. It's not only the raw material, but the energy that is used in the carbonization process. And that's uh, very, very important. And again, yeah, the, the capacitance uh, with cycle numbers are shown here. And just to say that the electroactivity is quite interesting. So one of our former students in, in the group uh, uh, is now working actually in this area uh, in, in a company called uh, Terra Loop, it's a new company. And uh, they are looking into carbon fibers that need to be also magnetic. And those magnetic carbon fibers are really special for uh, integration in the so-called flying wheels. Flying wheels are machines like the one that you see on the right, uh, that is like a, 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 an old method actually to store energy in the form of uh, rotational or kinetic energy. And this is an interesting uh, um, proposition to uh, energy storage in buildings and in cars, etc. But for that, we need carbon fibers that are also magnetic. And that's the beauty of wet spinning. And this is then why I, I like uh, wet spinning because it's a very unique approach so that in the dope that, uh, that we use for the spinning process, we can load particles, in this case, magnetic particles, therefore making the final filament not only conductive, but also uh, magnetic, as uh, is shown here by Mary Lundahl, that is in the bottom right. So to me, this is uh, very important because I think uh, wet spinning is one of the ways that we can produce advanced materials. And here we're talking to the high value material propositions that I introduced at the very beginning. One development that, that uh, we have been doing in collaboration with Nanjing Forestry uh, University is uh, here a different approach also for wet spinning as is shown on the top but using a cellulose derivative, and that would be carboxymethyl cellulose. And we have been playing with the idea of mixing uh, nanocellulose with carbon nanotubes. Uh, this also has been tested by many research groups around the world. 
uh, it's very interesting uh, to use nanocellulose as a dispersant of uh, carbon nanotubes uh, to produce uh, conductive material. So that's well reported. But in this case, we chose to use uh, carboxymethyl cellulose that is very easily to um, uh, couple with uh, dopamine. And dopamine is a molecule that is quite interesting because then you can develop very strong uh, water resistance. So that combination between carboxymethyl cellulose and dopamine, grafted dopamine, mixed with uh, carbon nanotubes in water suspension uh, can be used as a dope for wet spinning. And here the amount of carbon nanotubes can be 10, 20%, 5%, so relatively a smaller amount of carbon nanotubes. And this is very nice because the type of uh, uh, filaments that are produced are quite tough. Uh, what you see in the red line there is how we can increase the toughness without compromising the strength. And this is a property that usually goes in the opposite direction, right? Um, you can gain a strength, but then you reduce the strain or extensibility of the material. But this, for any special reason that I cannot explain, uh, we get materials that are not only stronger, but tougher. And they are very competitive. If you uh, see the image on the right, bottom right, uh, of uh, how that compares with filaments produced from polypropylene, viscose, or lyocell. Very interesting material. But what is new is that these are conductive as well. And for that reason, I want to introduce uh, the example of uh, application of these filaments uh, as an electroactive component. So by taking those uh, filaments, we can make yarns by twisting. Uh, you can see top left. And those yarns can be integrated in body to follow body motions. So all the uh, uh, data that is on the right is intended to show how, by extension, we can produce a change in resistivity. And that change resist of resistivity can be tracked with high uh, fidelity. And it's a very interesting way to measure motion with this type of filament, just to give an example. Another example is that being a conductive material and having some degree of resistance, we can also integrate those filaments in, in, uh, in wearables, in wovens or non-wovens. And in that case, by applying a current, we can produce uh, dual heating. And what it means is that we can locally produce heating uh, by applying a current. And that's show, uh, that, that, that response is shown in the bottom as we see how with the current, you can change the temperature of the material quite, quite nicely. So uh, for local heating, it's a, 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 an application that, that shows uh, the electroactive uh, properties of this type of filaments. I will skip this because of time. I want to cover other uh, aspects, but uh, metal organic frameworks is something that can also be done in this uh, coagulation bath, uh, we put the precursor for metal organic frameworks and, and maybe you are aware of the application of metal organic frameworks in many fields, in, including decontamination and, and gas capture. So this is another area where wet spinning is quite interesting. Um, I will skip this and now I would like to shift to two dimensions. And uh, I would like to refer, refer mainly to uh, two-dimensional films and structural color. In one-dimensional films, I want to show with this slide the idea that the films produced with nanocellulose can be made very transparent, and that would be uh, top right, or quite opaque. And uh, for those of you who are paper makers, you know the opacity of paper as described with concepts such as uh, Kubelka Monk theories, depends on light scattering in the material. And, and in the case of uh, nanocellulose, something similar happens. So if we have a material that has more porosity, then you have more scattering, and therefore you will have higher opacity. And what that means is that by um, separation, the nanocellulose, separating the nanocellulose by different sizes, as you can see on the, on the middle of this figure, that is a work uh, in collaboration with Cambridge, uh, Silvia Vingolini and my colleague in Finland, uh, Oli Ikala and their students. Here you can see how we are able to separate nanocellulose in different sizes, lateral sizes, and from those produce nanopapers. And those nanopapers will have different degree of uh, transparencies. 
And the explanation for that uh, opacity or the opposite transparency has to do with the porosity of the material based on what we know in paper making. But even here, the um, properties are even more interesting because we're in the nano scale domain. And what we notice is uh, the effect of something that is we call uh, super diffusion of light by using nanocellulose. So we go beyond paper in this sense. We go beyond the traditional theories of light scattering with paper uh, at this scale. And that's quite interesting because that means that we can fine tune uh, paper coating and formulations to produce transparency or high opacity. Um, in the same vein uh, about using two dimensional films of nanocellulose, of course, one thing is that of uh, water strength or water resistance, wettability. And on the left, you can see the typical case of a nanopaper, a film of nanocellulose. The water contact angle is eight degrees in this case, so it wets completely the nanofilm. Uh, and here the droplet is in green color, by the way, just for you to see. But if we take the nanocellulose film and we modify it, then it's very nice to see uh, uh, super hydrophobic materials that can be quite easily produced from the nanocellulose that we have in the film. And the, the way we have done this is using UV click, uh, click reaction or click coupling. Uh, so uh, I, I would like you to refer to the reference that is in the bottom, but it's an extremely simple process where we couple uh, tile groups on the film of nanocellulose, and then we put a, a, a hydrophobic molecule, uh, uh, a fatty acid or otherwise. And then that's what brings the hydrophobicity. The beautiful uh, aspect of this technology is that because it, it is UV click coupling, that means that we can especially uh, in a space resolve the pattern that we want to make as far as hydrophobicity. And for that reason here, you can see that, that by using a photo mask, we can install patterns of hydrophilic hydrophobic domains on the nanocellulose paper, the nano paper or the film for that matter. So uh, here illustrates the same concept. I don't need to repeat, but you get the idea but that by UV click, this is a quite uh, promising technique. And in this illustration, uh, colorful illustration on the right, you see the mapping of uh, hydrocarbon or fluorinated molecules that we have used to show how we can pattern the material in different um, uh, domains. And that's very important because then we can target this type of uh, wetting, selective wetting or targeted wetting. How important is this? You will wonder, well, one of the applications of course is in the area of flexible uh, electronics. And this is a, a, an ongoing project actually uh, supported by the EU Horizon 2020 program where we're working with different companies uh, uh, to look into films, uh, uh, in this particular case, actual regular paper, regular paper coated with nanocellulose or paper produced by uh, microcelluloses. And then on the paper, we are depositing, uh, for instance, in this case, sensors on the uh, far right, um, electrochromic displays, uh, batteries so that we self-power the material and we are printing um, batteries by the, with the help of companies like Barta. So this is very nice because uh, nanocellulose films allow us to do all these types of modifications to target um, different um, patterns on the surface, to also print batteries and to install sensors so that we have um, different activities, including uh, microfluidics and channels that can transport uh, different analytes in the material. Um, I want to bring briefly the issue of uh, structural color that is also very well known for cellulose. Of course, you all know the work of uh, um, Derek Gray in, in uh, McGill, uh, who has been a pioneer in the area of structural color with cellulose nanocrystals. And there are a lot of beautiful work coming out from Cambridge, uh, also from UBC, uh, my colleague Mark McLallan and many others. So these are really nice, uh, nice area. But the structural color, of course, is explained by the chirality and the twist that I mentioned at the very beginning of cellulose nanocrystals. So if we take a suspension of cellulose nanocrystals and we let it, uh, let it dry, eventually the crystals will be assembled in such patterns that you see here in, in this uh, SEM image, where the nanocrystal will be oriented in a helicoidal manner, as you see on the right, 
And that helicoidal arrangement is the one that is responsible for uh, selective light reflection. And that selective light reflection, what it means is that produce color with light, uh, different than dyes or pigments. Uh, here, the effect of color has to do with the arrangement in the nanoscale in the space. So this is very well known. And here we have examples. And when my students start to work with this, they really became fascinated with the colors, the iridescent patterns and all of this. And for that reason, we started to work with people in art and design. And then uh, I think they have had a, a lot of uh, um, interesting developments in the area. I, I want to show some of those. But one of those aspects that I think are practical and very important is the fact that this structural color doesn't fade. And I was surprised when we wrote this paper last year that there was no really demonstration about this effect of a structural color as resisting fading, uh, at least not to our knowledge. So um, we took uh, these um, uh, coatings of cellulose nanocrystals and we put them in textiles and we look at simulated sun for six months to see what the effect of the sun is. And of course, in the case of um, uh, typical dyes and pigments on textiles, they will die with the sun exposure. But for a structural color that I see, that I show on the right, there is no effect whatsoever of the sunlight exposition. There is no fading. So that's a uh, that's very important component that was known, but uh, for some reason was not uh, shown in a very simple way in the, in the literature. The other recent advance that plays into the two-dimensional two space is uh, the, the work of uh, uh, our uh, research fellow in, in Alto, uh, Blaise Tardy, and uh, collaborators in my group who have been looking also into something that I remember was mentioned a long time ago when we started to talk about cellulose nanocrystals, and is the possibility of using cellulose nanocrystals as adhesive. And, uh, of course, this is very interesting. Uh, we have always been thinking about it. But what happened uh, this year, uh, starting with work that we um, began uh, in 2019, is the simple idea of taking cellulose nanocrystals eco suspensions, putting them in between two solid surfaces and let them dry. In a short time, that material will form um, an assembly that is quite interesting. And that assembly makes the bonding between the two surfaces quite strong. And that has received a lot of attention in the community. The fact that we have this type of glue. It's a glue that is an isotropic, meaning that doesn't break in the shear direction, has extremely high um, uh, strength in the shear direction. So just to illustrate the point, this is uh, Luis Greca. He's uh, from Brazil, from uh, Curitiba. And he's very light, he's 72 kilos. But anyway, what you see here is a panel, that's Riz. Uh, he puts there a panel of wood and then we put in the cross direction, another panel of wood. We put a droplet of this cellulose nanocrystal suspension and in the meeting areas on the right and on the left. And then he stands on it. And by standing on it, that shear force is not able to support, uh, is able to support fully his weight. Actually, if I was to uh, stand on it, it will support my weight. I'm 20 kilos more than Luis. So it's very nice because it's uh, very uh, strong. Yet, as you can see here, with a normal force, it's very easy to, to remove the material. And this is very important in many electronic applications, electronic components, where you want to have very strong glue in the shear direction, but not in the normal direction, as uh, Luis showed here. So an isotropic glues, and these are shown to be with the same quality or, or better than uh, commercial glues that are very toxic. So the illustration is here again, uh, nine megapascals shear strength with only a few micrograms of cellulose nanocrystal suspension. And that means what you see on the right in green, that's a more or less a space compared to microfabricated adhesives and commercial structural adhesives. So very competitive when we think about the anisotropic adhesion that is achieved. Inter very interesting uh, development. And to close the two dimensions, I, I put here the cover slide that I have at the very beginning. And, and going back to a structural color, art, and design. And, and this is uh, one member of my group, uh, Ors Dierker. He happened to be a custom designer for the film industry, for movies. 
and he has been, I think, involved in, in, in uh, movies such uh, like uh, those from uh, Hollywood. Um, uh, I don't recall the names now, but very popular movies. And, and here, uh, uh, with Urs working with the chemical engineers and the artists in the group, came up with the idea of building this type of custom that you see on the left. The idea there on the chest of this um, maniki is that we have charred wood, and then on the charred wood or carbonized wood, we have placed cellulose nanocrystals to produce a structural color, and that makes those uh, beautiful uh, iridescent shimmering uh, materials. And uh, the whole concept is integrated in a beautiful design. So I, I find very provocative the idea of using science and technology together with art. And this, of course, is something that many colleagues around are looking into, especially in, in Sweden, in RISE. Uh, Aviltol, for instance, is very active in this area and, and others in UK, et cetera. So it's very interesting how we can combine um, different aspects of science. One particular aspect of this uh, custom is that it's all um, bio-based. So the idea here is to remove the utilization of uh, very toxic components in the custom design uh, for the film industry. And, uh, and I think this can fly very high. I think I have uh, maybe, um, I'm arriving almost to, to, to the end. Uh, and I, I don't think I can present all uh, that I wanted to show as far as structuring of 3D materials. But maybe I can very briefly um, walk through um, some few developments in the area. And maybe I can go very fast because these are very simple concepts. But the idea here is to make uh, three-dimensional objects with nanocellulose, and why not also with lignin, to produce uh, biomedical devices and, and biomaterials. And this is really the future here. Uh, for, for instance, uh, the ear that you see on the top, um, that ear is produced using bacterial cellulose and a biofabrication method that uh, we introduced a couple of years ago. So in this area, bacterial cellulose is very important. And, and of course, in Brazil, you have great people working in this area, um, great developments in, in Latin America, in Colombia as well. It's very beautiful. But uh, going back to the nanocellulose, the idea in 3D um, objects is, of course, uh, 3D printing. And, and here we have the case of tempoxidized cellulose nanofibrils, the regular cellulose nanofibrils. And I bring back the idea of acetylated nanocellulose. So I think you get the picture here, um, the possibility of changing the composition or, or the type of nanocellulose to target completely different materials. In some cases, those 3D printed objects uh, have very little shrinkage upon drying. And that's very interesting because that remains a major challenge. And the other case is the fidelity of the print. That's an important consideration. Um, so, uh, uh, Rubina, one of my PhD students, had been working in, in, in this area. And one of the recent developments that was published this year was the idea of making 3D uh, printed grids for patches for hard um, uh, conditions. So this is very interesting and, and calls, again, the idea of nanocellulose uh, as being a very interesting material because we can make nanocellulose elastic if we combine it with uh, some other polymers like the one that you see here. And it can also allow for cell attachment. And here we prove that cell proliferation, cell attachment and proliferation is quite ideal for cellulose nanomaterial. So that's very good. And then also can be conducted. And, and that multifunctionality can be installed in cellulose-based materials because cellulose is such a wonderful, unique um, substrate for modification and for combination with other materials. Uh, and in this particular case, being the heart and electroactive material, of course, we want to have it extensible during the pulses, but also electroactive, conductive. And this is an example that worked quite well. So we have all these three properties at the same time. Um, very briefly about now taking these uh, uh, hydrogels that I, we have used for 3D printing. What if we dry them, remove water, and we produce aerogels? And those aerogels can be called bio aerogels. Um, and this is uh, some work that, um, of course, uh, have pioneering uh, developments in, um, uh, uh, by people like um, um, Butova. Uh, Tatiana Butova in, in Paris, in, um, in France, 
uh, very nice work making aerogels uh, and um, aerogels that are super insulators. My point here, at least in uh, our work and, and those that are around, is the idea of using cellulose and including nanocellulose to produce uh, aerogels. And if you see the development in the area, you can see that the, the growth is actually um, increasingly exponentially uh, or at least uh, consistently. Uh, and in many of the cases, we see cellulose as one of the components for these aerogels. So one of those actually comes from work from Campinas, and, and this is um, uh, a visitor in the group, Ferreira, uh, Felipe, that, that did some work in this area. And main message here is that combining nanocellulose with bioactive glass was a very interesting uh, cryogel that was produced uh, by oven drying that uh, allowed the regeneration of bone. And that's shown here uh, in these slides that I'm, I have no time to explain, but you can go to the reference and check uh, the, the beautiful work that shows again cell proliferation and how the nanocellulose becomes a scaffold for uh, bone growth. The other one also in the group that is interesting is the idea of using very lightweight materials, uh, aerogels again, mimicking the case of the hammer, if we can call it that way, of uh, the mantis shrimp. So the mountain shrimp is this um, sea animal that is very strong in this little hammer that it has at the end. And, and, and the reason for that strength has to do with uh, something that, that we have reviewed earlier and um, is the assembling of the nanomaterials in, in the biological system. And, and for that reason, having this type of um, situation, the crack propagation is quite tortuous. And that means that we have very high impact resistance. So imagine on the left, bottom left, and, and then in the center, how the um, helicoidal structure of the material makes the breaking point such that the stress propagation in the left is linear, more or less, but on the right is more tortuous. And that makes the material super strong. So using this concept, uh, something that we attempted to do was to achieve similar performance with cellulose nanocrystals. So the work that I show next briefly was published uh, last year is using hydrogels from nanocrystalline cellulose, CNC, that were suspended. And when in water, when we suspend the nanocrystalline cellulose in water, we have this uh, chiral pneumatic assembly that I have explained earlier in the anisotropic bottom phase. And if we take that material in the bottom and we remove water by giving techniques, then we get um, uh, hydrogel that then eventually can be converted in aerogel by removal of water. But the beauty of this uh, type of uh, hydrogels and aerogels is that they, ke they keep the chiral pneumatic structure of the nanocrystals. And for that reason, you see on the top that there is some light reflection that is very interesting. And that light reflection speaks to something that I will show next, and this is the, the, the um, optomechanical response of the material. But before going there, I want to say that because of the structuring of the nanomaterial, these very foam-like uh, three-dimensional objects, these aerogels, are capable of support very high weight. So here you have a brick, two kilograms on a very small area. That can be scaled to 170 tons per square meter of resistance of these very lightweight uh, aerogels. And the idea here, as you follow the specific toughness against a specific strength, is that when we structure the material from disorder to oriented or pneumatic to chiral pneumatic, that is the one that I introduced earlier, then we have an increase in both strength and toughness. And for that very reason, here we see the results of the same map for our materials that you see in the blue uh, cloud there. Very interesting. But another thing that we observe that is quite also appealing is that these materials not only are strong, but are also optomechanical responsive, meaning that if we take the material and we compress it, so it will change the color. And that can be very interesting for uh, many applications related to strength and signaling the load of, of a material in a, in, in a composite or in advanced materials. Okay, um, maybe um, I'm now one hour. If I take uh, only uh, one more minute and I abuse of your patience, um, 
I want to also show something that is ongoing, I work with the South China University of Technology, where we have combined cellulose nanofibers with olacrylamide. And then we have added uh, a very well-known electrolyte, lithium chloride, that is a hydrogen bonding disruptor. And this is quite interesting because with this type of hydrogels, even if we go to uh, sub-freezing temperatures, in this case, minus, minus 80 degrees, the hydrogels still remains uh, very extensible um, and um, uh, strong. And that's very interesting. If you compare the one on the left in the absence of lithium chloride and the uh, gel on the right that contains the lithium chloride. So that synergy and hydrogen bonding in these nanomaterials, it, making this type of objects can be very important. And in this case, for sub-freezing temperatures. It's very important, of course, maybe not for Brazil, because uh, in the tropics, uh, we are pretty warm. But when you go to the um, North Hemisphere, Canada, Finland, Sweden, then you need to worry about cold temperatures in the winter. And these materials, of course, are important for that reason. And likewise, the same materials can remain conductive. Even though they are gels, uh, they remain conductive at very low temperatures. So that's, that's an example of other applications where the properties of nanocellulose can be exploited. Anyway, um, I think I, I, I end my, my talk. There are more components that I have no time to, to explain. One of those is uh, phase changing materials. But um, in summary, what I wanted to say is that um, uh, I presented um, here the case of tannic acid, lignin, but I mainly made emphasis on cellulose. I could have talked you know, for hours about these objects, but I tried to show to you the recent developments. There are many others, but uh, some highlights that I want to show signaling to the opportunities that we have for nanocelluloses and to grow in the value chain from traditional products to advanced products. And if you are coming from the pulp and paper industry, maybe you want to think how some companies, especially those in, uh, that I know at least in Finland, Sweden, uh, and also in Canada, they are looking into new products. And in many cases already some companies are producing value and having, uh, you know, having a revenue. They, they are generating income by uh, using materials that were not known 10 years ago. Uh, there are examples of companies now that they have the biomedical division to put, in a, to put a case where nanomaterials are produced in very small volumes, but uh, with a very good um, uh, margins of uh, profitability. And I think uh, we're going to go more and more in that direction. So to end, uh, plant fibers are winning the environmental race. It's not only about economics, it's also about the performance and also about the environment. And I think here we have a very strong case. Just to acknowledge the sponsors of our research work, uh, including those uh, companies that you see here, as well as um, federal agencies, both in Finland, US, also in Canada. And uh, my heartfelt acknowledgement to my group members. Uh, of course, I'm just directing a group, but uh, they are the ones responsible for all the work. And what I do is just try to promote their work and explain to you what they do in the lab. My contribution is just making sure that they are, they are all well fed. And uh, we also try to inspire them to continue growing in science and to produce uh, some nice discoveries, hopefully. Uh, will find also value and impact in the future. So with that, I finish and thank you for your uh, time. And, and uh, I, I look forward to engaging in question and answers. Let's see, Felipe, Professor Claudio, yes. Okay, <laughs> well, uh... Professor uh, Orlando Rojas, thank you very much for this uh, great uh, presentation. We, um, uh, it's um, amazing how many opportunities uh, that we have in several areas, uh, such as electronics, medical arts, textiles, and et cetera, et cetera, that you have presented. It was uh, wonderful. Uh, presentation. And we do have um, some questions here that I, I will start to 
to ask, uh, I would tell the name of the, the person who asked the question and the question. Uh, the first one is Marcelo Muguet from Clabin here in Brazil. The question is, hi Orlando, could you comment a bit on the economics of the lignin nanoparticle production process? Yes. Marcelo, great to, to hear your, your question and, and uh, greetings to you. Of course, I remember you quite well. Uh, I remember you from Finland and now you are very successful in, in Brazil. So happy to hear your question. So yes, the economics of lignin particles is quite attractive. We put out a paper, I think it was last year, where we show the um, eco eco techno-economic analysis for, for the leading nanomaterials. And, and I may have it here. Let me just make sure, because it may be that I have the numbers so that I don't invent for you. But um, um, yeah, no, unfortunately, I don't have it here. But I can refer to that paper. Um, I can tell you, of course, the addition of, um, uh, of the the extraction of the lignin as a, from a black liquor or from a solution um, and conversion into um, particles, of course, demands some energy because we need to heat a tube and we need also to push air through. So as a matter of fact, those expenses are not that great. Um, the major issue in the techno-economic analysis that I remember is actually what to do with the solvent. So if the, if the lignin solution is equals based, if it is a black liquor, so it's no major issues with the water, right? But if it is acetone from, argon, from an organosol lignin, then we have to deal with the acetone evaporation, right? So those aspects that are more related to the environment and what to do with the uh, vapors uh, are the ones that drive the economics, I would say. Uh, so uh, the cost, I don't have a exact number. You can check from our papers, but if I'm not mistaken, it's in, of the order of, um, what was that? I better don't say anything because I, want, I don't want to be wrong. But it's extremely economical process depending on the type of uh, lignin solution that you use. Uh, in a follow-up paper this year with uh, Misha Balashki, actually, uh, we use a techno-economic analysis for organosol lignins. And in those cases, the cost of evaporation, that is the cost of energy, was actually quite low. And they were the most competitive lignins that we obtained compared to craft lignins, for instance. So in a nutshell, I don't have the number for you. You can check the literature. We have, we have calculated it. Uh, but uh, it's actually quite competitive. I can tell you that it's a very attractive uh, proposition that of using lignin uh, for this type of aer aer uh, aerosol reactors. Now, this may be different for other processes where lignin is precipitated in an anti-solvent or in solvent shifting methods. In those cases, you deal with a lot of uh, solvents and there maybe the costs are a little bit higher. Thank you. Uh, another question from Cristiano Cardoso, uh, Professor Rodas, is, isn't the 30% uh, growth of the bioeconomy in 20 years very conservative? Uh, so that, that figure that I show is obtained from a, a report from BTT, a very good report, but the calculation of 30% uh, was made uh, by uh, the FinCERES flagship when we were putting together the proposal. And uh, basically, this is an approximation, of course, where we assume data that was available uh, uh, at that time for us. So the 30% is uh, what we calculated for that time. I don't know how that translates into the future, especially after COVID times. And I don't know how it compares with the whole bioeconomy uh, landscape, minding that here we consider only the forest sector, uh, but agricultural sector is um, maybe the most relevant to the uh, future bioeconomy or is equally relevant at the very least. So uh, that calculation refers only to the forest sector, but probably the numbers are probably more attractive, even if we look into agricultural, uh, especially agricultural residues or agroforestry operations. Uh, but I cannot comment on what that percent would be in those cases. 
at any rate, these are just approximations. The, the main point is um, that there is value to be made in these um, uh, applications and there are very good prospects. But the only way to grow and to facilitate those um, uh, possibilities or, or, or those uh, sort of uh, um, uh, ecosystems is to have a very important participation from regulation and government. I think this is very important so that we have a playing field as far as regulation, taxation. So what I'm making, the point I'm making is a very important, the participation, not only from researchers and industry, but also other players. It's extremely important to achieve the future bioeconomy that, uh, that uh, we all think about. Okay, thank you. Um, Beatriz Bernardo asked, um, she says, hello, could you please comment an example of machine learning use in this application? I'm um, not sure, uh, right. or in these uh, applications, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So um, in, in the case of tannic acid particles, the, the, just to repeat, the application that we pursue was to be able to use uh, experimental data to fit an optimization protocol, Bayesian optimization protocol, that uses very few data points to <clears throat> produce the optimal pathway to produce particles of desirable shapes. So we can go to cubic or needle-like or otherwise spherical particles just by choosing the right parameters that are obtained by this optimization method. But if uh, we go into different other applications, of course, machine learning is very important in the forestry industry. Um, and this morning, for instance, just by chance, I was talking to a company here in Canada uh, about the subject, and uh, uh, they use machine learning to optimize uh, formulation, for instance, for delivery in crop protection. Uh, the type of formulations to fit the different demands can be obtained by machine learning methods. Just to put an example, um, so machine learning is quite wide as far as the type of applications. It's very generic. It can deal with optimization of processes uh, down to formulation of chemicals, for instance, right? So um, in the biological industries, of course, this is also very relevant in, in screening, for instance, um, best modification methods. And, and an example I can give is those of producing uh, cellulosic surfaces that are bioactive. And when you produce bioactive cellulose targeting given um, uh, antibodies, then you can use either proteins that are natural in the body, or you can make uh, proteins or, or uh, polypeptides um, that have a sequence that needs to be designed so that you have selective, selective binding to the target molecule. And to design the architecture, you need to have combinatorial libraries. And that combination can be best treated if we use machine learning approaches so that we optimize um, the, the, the more or less the decision making in the process. Okay, thank you. Um, we have now a question from Sweden, Frederick Poyet. And he asks, based on the availability and chemical structure, is the extraction and isolation of tannin molecules presented economically viable? Uh, uh, th thank you, and, and thank you for joining uh, today. You, I, I realize that you are maybe uh, midnight <laughs> in the <laughs> talk, or maybe. That's right. uh, so that's that's great. So thank you. Uh, yeah. So of course, the utilization, for instance, of bark has always been an issue. Uh, and I think uh, it hasn't gone that far, even though there are so many beautiful prospects for utilization of uh, pretty much a residue. Bark nowadays is just burned. But bark, bark, bark contains a lot of different chemicals that are quite interesting. And, uh, and of course, there are companies already doing uh, some work in the area. Um, if you go to Portugal, that would be the typical, maybe best example of utilization of bark, for, in, for instance, in the cork. But, um, but also in many other extractives, and they are very active in Portugal and, and many other places. But, but in a nutshell, yeah, the extraction can be uh, demanding as far as the type of solvents that are used. I know in the case of uh, some extractives from birch bark, very well studied in Finland, uh, Ovo Academy, for, to give an example, um, uh, betulins, for instance, 
the common extractives uh, involve uh, solvents, uh, you know, organic solvents. But nowadays, there are also very interesting developments, again, using ionic liquids that be, can be recycled. And that makes the extraction process quite interesting because, again, the ionic liquids may be low cost and can be recyclable. So I think these are examples of developments in this area that can lower the costs. And, uh, and uh, that applies to tannins, of course, but also applies to other extractives, not only tannins. Um, many other examples exist. I, I can talk about in Chile, the case of saponins that is uh, so important in many na native species and, and similar apply. So my point is that I think uh, this is an area that needs to be expanded and studied more, but the opportunities are very important. And I encourage uh, the audience to think about the possibilities of using more and more those fine chemicals that we find in bark. Thank you. Actually, I think you was already uh, answered. Uh, he, he asked, in which scale? But I think you heard the examples you gave, it's already yeah. answered. Uh, Bruna Virginia from our lab here asked, could you say what is the economic and technical potential for the extraction of nanomaterials from primary and secondary sludge generated in the effluent treatment plant of a craft pulp mill? Okay, that's a very detailed question and I have no answer, right? It's a very specific question. But one thing that I can say is that um, uh, the cost of nanocellulose is not really that high if you consider the techno-economic analysis, especially for producing units that are on site in an integrated mill. In an integrated mill, the major cost usually you think about will be energy for microfluidization, for instance. But in an integrated mill, that's really minimized. And then the mo most important factor is the raw materials, and that means wood or the fiber. Uh, so that's the economics. And you can refer to our papers. We have a couple of papers about also the cost structure of CNC and CNF. It's, it's quite interesting. And the numbers that you will find there is that for CNF, if I'm not wrong, we're talking about around $2 per dry kilogram of uh, CNF, micro nanocellulose. Uh, um, don't quote me, but I think we better go to the reference. I, I don't remember exactly, but say if, uh, $2, $3 for CNC is double that amount. Uh, so relatively speaking, uh, given that these are nanomaterials that are used in very small concentrations, the economics are quite attractive, I, I would say. So that's one aspect. Now, if to that aspect, we also link the fact that the source material can be a waste, then the economics become better. So we have been doing um, uh, nanocelluloses from residues from, from pineapple, uh, from uh, empty fruit bunches uh, for in the palm, palm, tree, uh, uh, palm oil tree. Uh, or from sugarcane bagas uh, and all this. And if you go then to the to industry, even from recycled paper, there are opportunities to produce nanocellulose. And in fact, we have uh, uh, one paper where we use uh, recycled paper to produce nanocellulose and then to use it as a coating for paper and the interest. The results are very interesting because then you can achieve very nice printability. Just to put an example how, Integration of materials is important in industry. If we take materials that are a waste and they are reutilized in the same um, chain of production, then this is the best economical um, uh, pro proposition in, in a mill, right? So I don't know the particular case of a sludge, uh, but that, that sounds to me that is quite interesting, especially because in the sludge you can have some, uh, for instance, minerals or particles that can be quite interesting to process. But um, uh, I have no experience with a slush directly. Okay, thank you very much. Um, now the question is from Jordan Perrin. Um, does superhydrophobic nanocellulose can be applied on paper by coating? What is the minimum amount necessary to keep these properties? Oh. oh. Um, nice to see you. I, I also know you. This is great that you are attending today. So my pleasure to, to remember great colleagues from the past. So uh, for the coatings, I, I think, um, of course, coating is a very interesting process. And, and um, 
there are different approaches to that. There are some very good laboratories working on this. The fact is that nanocellulose is a very sheer thinning material in water, and that allows us to use a very optimal uh, coating procedures, given that, um, that again, is their sheer thinning. But for fast processing, this is a challenge. Uh, so if we're thinking on barrier properties, uh, you can see uh, some of our work actually, uh, where we review the subject, and this is still remains a challenge because nanocellulose can become a very good barrier to, uh, to gas, but in the process to um, installing nanocellulose films that are uniform and defect free on paper in fast production units, that can be a little bit challenging, right? But still, I think uh, there are very good developments. Uh, uh, I can mention those uh, from OVA Academy that they have done very nice uh, work. Um, but uh, about the hydrophobization, uh, of course, the, the idea here is probably to first coat the nanocellulose, taking advantage of the affinity of cellulose with cellulose, meaning nanocellulose with fibers. It makes a very strong binding. And then do the hydrophobization after the material has been coated. And, and for that, then I think the, the route, um, the preferred route probably is that one. That is to have the coating first and then using uh, UV click or other procedures, uh, including vapor deposition to have the coating on the already installed nanocellulose that can be, act, can be acting as a barrier, but also as a water repellent material. Okay, another one, you. Um, um, and that comes from um, Julio Ortiz, and, and he asks, uh, he says, I study molecular simulations of cellulose systems, and I see much more experimental researches on cellulose events. Could you comment about the role of theoretical studies in this area? This is a great yeah, question, uh, Julio. Thank you for asking. Um, I don't do molecular simulation, or uh, but but I collaborate in in those directions. And what I tell you <laughs> is that, for instance, in the FinCeres flagship that we have in Finland, um, uh, I, two years ago when we um, designed the pathway to achieve uh, the operation of the, of the of the flagship for eight years, this is still going. 25 million euros investment in the in this area. Uh, when we designed that flagship, one of the things that we agreed to do was to propose that um, uh, simulation, um, molecular dynamics, or com computational chemistry should lead the experimental effort. Meaning, we first perform the simulation, the theoretical calculation, and then we do the experimentation. So. In my view, it's extremely important uh, as a tool to save energy and uh, investment in laboratory and uh, experimental efforts. Uh, and this is how we are operating. So in, in this space, I can tell you that, uh, uh, at least in our case, in this uh, FinCeres flagship, we have involved a lot of uh, uh, modeling and that has been quite fulfilling. Uh, for instance, to predict um, optoelectronic properties of materials based on cellulose, and, and also in predicting interactions between cellulose and, and surfactants and cellulose with chitin, et cetera, et cetera. Beautiful examples where before doing the experiments, we get a feeling uh, uh, about the theoretical expectation of uh, what is going to happen. And going back to the initial question of machine learning in, in that area also, uh, see, given that in many experiments, you generate a lot of data machine learning combined with experimentation uh, is uh, quite important nowadays just to, to, to put the machine learning uh, again in the in the in the top of the table uh, but I think that that's uh, pretty much my view uh, modeling should lead experimentation thank you there are three more questions here <laughs> Orlando for you <laughs> good. Um, actually I have I have an information here that was uh, around 150 people uh, watching your presentation. Okay, good number. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's wonderful. And as you said, people from Sweden that's uh, quite late there right now. Right? <laughs> so we are very happy about this. 
the question is um, was made by Rafael Machado Góes, and he asks, what is the possibility of nanocellulose application to improve the resistance of paper packaging, especially to improve the RCT ring crush test? Wow, this is wow. also a very specific question, but, but uh, I only can comment in general. Um, uh, I know some people that were collaborating, especially in North Carolina State University, where they have a um, tissue uh, group that is working heavily in this area, and they have considered the use of nanocellulose in tissue paper, but also in uh, other paper grades. And uh, my general comment, I think, uh, that uh, I can say is that, in general, the main principle of work is that nanocellulose can be used in paper materials to uh, keep the strength while lowering the basis weight or the grammage. So you can have fiber savings by replacing actual fibers with small amounts of nanocellulose. Uh, the, the, the reason for that is that, as we explained or alluded earlier, uh, nanocellulose acts as a very strong binder. And um, a, a postdoc from Brazil that is in the group, uh, um, Bruno, he has uh, shown in some work how nanocellulose can become a universal binder, meaning doesn't matter what you have, whether polystyrene particles or Teflon particles or glass or yeast, or pollen, when you mix any of those with nanocellulose and you dry, you produce very strong materials. That was published this year in Science Advances by, by Bruno Matos and, and, and Blaise uh, Tardy and others in the group. Main point is that when nanocellulose is, is added into a fiber network, upon drying, the capillary forces really bring all the system together and produce extremely high adhesion. And that means that the strength is increased tremendously. Therefore, you can reduce uh, fiber content, reduce fiber amount, lower the grammage, and still keep the uh, mechanical strength, or in some cases, improve it. Um, for the ring crush test, I don't have really any information. But of course, th this, this uh, had to do with um, um, out of plane um, resistance. And in those cases, of course, um, uh, I would need to think about it. But uh, in some earlier work, we have shown, in the case of cellulose nanocrystals, the very high elastic modulus, uh, especially if you are able to align them in the out-of-plane direction, then you can get very stiff materials. And I guess that's what you want. Thank you. Um, the next. The uh, question is from Tamiris from the uh, from here from our university, and Tamiris asks. Um, she says, "Hi, Orlando. Congratulations for your for the lecture. Could you tell us about the economic and practical aspects of nanolignins currently?" So I uh, thank you, Tamaris, or Tamaris. Um, uh, thank you for your comment. So um, the the best I can do, perhaps, is to refer to you to a paper that we published this year with Monica, with a group of uh, Monica Osterberry, uh, in green chemistry, and uh, relates to lignin particles. And in that article, we have uh, economics business prospects and application is quite interesting. So if, if you can search a green chemistry with my last name, then you can find that paper in green chemistry related to lignin particles. It's very interesting. So I cannot say that lignin particles are being used today, but I think the prospects for utilization are, are quite attractive. And in that paper, you can see a table with all comparisons for different type of uh, um, systems. Um, the production uh, cost is relatively small, as, as uh, I indicated earlier with a different question. But what you can do with those particles can be quite attractive. Think about properties like antimicrobial properties. Think about structuring, as I presented earlier in my uh, presentation, right? The, when we talk about membranes and, and, um, and uh, coating materials. Um, or think about 
tickling emulsions. So we have worked a lot with emulsions. And uh, in this particular case, lignin particles are excellent emulsifiers uh, for oil and water emulsions. And from there, you can think about crop protection and bioactive encapsulation. So many opportunities for these materials. The point that, that I want to make is that um, I think there are very many uh, interesting economic aspects in the utilization of lignin particles. Uh, I'm not aware of any company today that is doing this. I only know my colleague in NC State, Orlin Veller, they have a spin-off, uh, Bena Nova, that are producing lignin particles. And I think uh, <coughs> they are exploring possibilities, uh, but uh, beyond these cases, I don't know any other, but I can foresee that this will become uh, more and more um, uh, popular, I would say, or at least I hope, because I think these are very interesting materials. Uh, we have two more. Uh, Ana Carolina Nascimento asks, how about the resistance of NFC from bacteria comparing with NFC from wood or bagasse? And how about the yield in this process? So the, um, the nanocellulose, we, we usually call uh, bacterial nanocellulose. Um, so the bacterial cellulose that is uh, produced by um, biological uh, by, uh, microorganisms uh, is a very interesting uh, material. So the short answer is the cellulose that is produced by bacteria is pure uh, in contrast with the nanocellulose that is produced from uh, plants. Uh, no matter what you do with the starting fiber, there is always going to be residual hemicellulose and residual lignin in the final nanofibular cellulose. But in the case of bacterial cellulose, of course, most of you know, is pure cellulose. And the second thing is a high molecular weight, higher degree of polymerization. Uh, so all that meaning that the, the, on, on an intrinsic uh, fashion, the nanomaterial, the, the fibrils produced by bacteria are stronger and longer than those produced by plants. Now, the other thing that is different is that it's very beautiful, I think, is that in bacterial cellulose, you produce the fibrils and you in situ already can guide the formation of biofilms. And those biofilms are extremely strong and they are so well interconnected network uh, in such a way that even if they are immersed in water, they are not going to break apart. So to put this in perspective, if you take a nano paper or a film made from cellulose nanofibrils and you put it in water, eventually it will break unless you play some tricks like putting kytosan and things that, that we have reported. But if it is pure, it will break. If you take a pellicle of bacterial cellulose and you put it in water, it will remain in water for years because the network is so strong that it's not going to uh, fall apart. Uh, so this is one of the beauties of uh, bacterial cellulose that you can guide the growth, you can produce the shapes you want, and the material is so well interconnected that will keep the uh, structure even in wet condition. And the yield. The yield, of course, is very important, but um, um, in nanofibular cellulose, the yield is quite high. Uh, uh, not nanocrystal. Nanocrystal cellulose is, is uh, relatively low, even though there are reports that you can read from my colleague, Eero Conturi, or, or also the work of uh, J.Y. Su, for instance, where they report the production of CNC at actually pretty uh, high yields. In, in the case of uh, J.Y. Su, he reports the use of dicarboxylic acids to produce high yield CNC combined with CNF. So the yield, while the typical sulfuric acid hydrolysis is pretty low, we're talking about 30% or, or, or in that ballpark, uh, in other methods can be quite high. For CNF, of course, the yield is very high because what you do is mechanical deconstruction. So once you start with fibers, the yield is pretty high for CNF. And for bacterial cellulose, I, 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 maybe it's difficult to talk about yield unless you think about the yield in sugar conversion from the culture medium to the nanocellulose, right? And, and there we, we have different yields depending on the microorganism. Um, and then we have um, 
our last question here from, uh, from Mexico. Pepe Negrete, who is sending greetings from Mexico. Great. And he says, hello, is there already any application of nanotechnology in paper money? Banknotes. In banknotes. Uh, not that I know, but I, uh, but I do know that um, there are applications for CNCs uh, in making banknotes that are un for anti-counterfeiting purposes. So the use of iridescent patterns with cellulose and crystals have been tested. Also the use of um, um, quantum dots uh, together with nanocellulose, I believe, have been also used for bank notes. And there are developments in those areas. Not, not too much about the, the material itself, but as additives to, uh, for instance, anti-counterfeiting and that type of application. Um, but besides those, I'm not aware. And maybe, maybe it's difficult to know, right? Because usually those formulations are very well kept. Um, but, uh, but I can say that uh, there are some, and there are some publications related to the topic. So uh, before we, we close and, and, and thank you again, I would like to remember all that um, we'll have tomorrow a, we will have tomorrow uh, the seminar uh, that will be given by Thomas Husseno. And, uh, but it will be at 10 a.m. in the morning uh, in Sao Paulo in, in Brazilian time, right? Or, um, uh, and it will be 2 p.m. in London, 3 p.m. in Sweden, 9 a.m. in Santiago, 9 a.m. in Toronto, 6 a.m. in Los Angeles, 4 p.m. in Jerusalem, and 10 p.m. in Seoul. So I'm <laughs> that's it will be in a different uh, timing, right? Um, the name of the, 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 the seminar or the talk will be Towards a Better Understanding of Cellular Swelling, Dissolution and Regeneration at Molecular Level. Um, well, I think. Also, another uh, Felipe uh, Pedazoli, the responsible for this um, this first um, um, uh, this first uh, seminar, international seminar, uh, is helping me here, and he's also wrote me that uh, next. Tuesday on the 15th, we also have um, here in our event, uh, Professor Bala Shin, right? So I think, uh, Felipe, those were the, um, the messages uh, I had to pass to all of you. And uh, again, uh, Professor Orlando Rojas, it was a, a great pleasure to have you here with us, and it was excellent, great uh, presentation. And uh, uh, we learned so much from you. Uh, it was great, and, and we, we do thank you so much. And we hope to, to have uh, other meetings, but not distant meetings, yeah. so we can meet in person, you know, to have more uh, uh, um, opportunities to to talk and to exchange uh, such great knowledge. Thank you again. And uh, you, I promise I will, not, I will I will make it tomorrow. Six hours. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think now we can. Yeah, we, we can. Uh,